Every day, more and more people are making movies. Filmmaking has become the new garage band. I'm Johnny DiLoretto and this is Frame Lines, the series that aims the lens on those who are out there making movies. Some are backyard Kubricks, making movies for fun, and others are aspiring Spielbergs, professionals working hard to make it in the industry. Lines is brought to you in part by grants by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Mid-Ohio Filmmakers Association, connecting filmmakers with resources, opportunities, and each other. Peter John Ross hosts a roundtable. It's like a film festival panel in your living room. So one of the things that's really radically changed is as budgets and shoots get smaller. Yeah, wow. And you become a cinematographer, combination gaffer in your own grip all at once. Uh, now that you have to have some of that experience, how does, how does that affect things? Is it, is it a good thing or a bad thing that you now have to not only shoot, but you have to light as well? Uh, it's bad in, well, especially on the client side, it's a bad thing because they think they're saving a bunch of money when you're on a shoot and, and what's the reality of it is, is it's just taking so much longer and so inefficient because just like Greg said, I mean, this happens all the time is you got your shot set and, you know, the person you're interviewing or whatever sits down and, okay, well, now I need to tweak things. I have to move out of the way of the camera and, you know, go tweak those things myself. So it's very inefficient to do things that way. Um, and plus you're missing out on uh, collaboration opportunities where you know, if, you have, if you have an audio guy or a, a grip or, or a gaffer or, or whatever it might be, um, that person might have some ideas that can help improve the look of the image and you know, obviously things are gonna go quicker and, and much more efficiently. Well, yeah, well for me it's, um, it's true that I've seen crew positions shrink. I mean over the years they have just dwindled and dwindled and uh, many uh, out-of-town producers and, and they don't have to be from out of town I mean it could be locals too they've cut out that some of the key positions because they just the you know there is a rate structure and and you know it can get expensive to to fill a crew so they drop titles that's the first thing they do and um, you lose some of those relationships that you've had with crews that you've worked with for years because now they they just not they're not in the budget you can't get them on the jobs and uh, I mean I, I've seen it coming for years and it's affected me greatly but at the same time it, it's one of the things that's had fueled me in learning how to light differently changing the way I do things which you know brought me to the LED world and the ability to manipulate light fast and not have to carry heavy things because mm -hmm. it, it's just the nature of the beast. By downsizing, your tools have to downsize. Things have to change. I can't walk around with 1200s anymore. I can't walk around with 2500 or 4K. I just don't have the help. Mm -hmm. I'd still use them, and that would, get, you know, if I had the crew. So when I have to put a budget together for somebody who's coming in and we're providing lights and a camera. You know, I used to have a number that I would hit every time, and it involved a lot of HMIs and cable. It doesn't happen anymore. It's so it's like, okay, so let me think about this. So I was Kino Flows, so now I'm LEDs, and okay, and I got this guy and this guy, and what's the skill level? So I'll put, I'll build a lighting package, probably you know, that fit that job, um, and uh, that's what's kind of caused me to change well, and that's my a whole great, concept of that's a great what segue. I do. That's well, a the, perfect. Control, the control freak in me it loves being the only guy on set, but I realize I'm not doing my job as well as I could. I mean, the, the, the film is suffering. I just shot a 48 and I was, no complaints, it was just, we ended up not having the crew. The people couldn't get to the set. And so 
it was a 12 hour, 12 and a half hour day. I sat for 20 minutes in that day. I lost three pounds. I had a blast. I loved it. <laughs> but there's a, there's a couple, <laughs> well, I just remember I got up and I was like, holy, I was like, <laughs> uh, but I, I remember there was like several things. Oh, I'd love to put the, a different lens on. Yeah. I was stuck with one lens because I, I mean, I was running every, every little thing. Oh, let's put a little flag back there. Who's sat in that flag? Me. Yeah. Oh, who's, let's get that, that window come, that window light coming there. It was me. And I loved it, but I knew if I had like one, you know, really good grip, yeah. it would have, it would have, there would have been some more camera moves, et cetera. So. And more light control, I'm sure. And more light control. Yeah, yeah you could have that's... done more with the same amount of time. Yes. If yeah. you just had yeah. more yeah. people. Yeah. Ever notice how with your favorite TV series that some episodes have big guest stars and exotic locations, while other episodes pretty much just take place in only the one location that you're used to seeing week in, week out? Well, those episodes that take place in just the one usual location are cheaper to produce. And these are called bottle episodes. Typically, on episodic television, a show for its entire season gets only one budget. In order to keep aside some portion of that budget to be used on other, more ambitiously produced episodes, the ones that will take the story to an exotic location and maybe include a guest star or two, the producers will opt to create less costly episodes that primarily use the show's regular cast and its existing sets. The term bottle episode originated from Star Trek The Original Series, where the creators used the phrase ship in a bottle to describe those episodes that were budgetarily constrained to using mainly the existing Enterprise sets and the regular cast. The money saved on these less expensive episodes allowed for the budget on other episodes to be increased, to do bigger special effects and to shoot at other locations away from the usual set. Another benefit of doing a bottle episode Many series have used it as a challenge to craft a show under the constraints of limited locations and minimal visual or special effects, and to focus more on things like the characters and the story. I'm Jocelyn, thanks for watching. Coming up next, Framelines goes on the set of an indie film. You want to talk, Frankie? I'll make you a deal. We'll stop for some smack on the way back to county. We started out with an idea of, uh, when I say we, I mean uh, uh, Jared Brennan and myself as a writing team. I came up with an idea for a story that would take place in, a, in an abandoned warehouse. Um, what I didn't realize was that when you have no money, Finding a really cool abandoned warehouse location in Columbus is what's known as really hard. Uh, I got very lucky the fr late Friday afternoon before the Sunday shoot. I was on the phone frantically trying to find a location. By about four o'clock Friday afternoon for the Sunday shoot, I finally found someone who owned a warehouse location who was willing to let me shoot there for free. If it hadn't been for that, there would be no, no short film. You, if you really want to make a film, you literally cannot take no for an answer. You have to be as resourceful as you possibly can be, especially when there's no money, when you can't pay people for the location. What I found was that I reached the point where I was calling up people that I wouldn't have thought of calling up to network. Hey, I need an abandoned warehouse. Do you know anyone who might have one? And I, literally in about a matter of two hours, I networked my way to a guy who I'd never heard of before, who said, 
okay, yeah, I'll show you some locations. I met with him. He, I, I think he liked me. He liked what I was doing. He said, yeah, you can shoot here and it'll cost you nothing. That's kind of a miracle. And I think the miracle for me was you just don't give up. If, but if I hadn't found that location, I would not have done this film. Advice I would give to other producers. Uh, surround yourself with people who are more talented than you are, who have experience or not, but uh, I was very fortunate. I, I surrounded myself with people who, who knew what they were doing or at least had a lot of passion to be involved with a film project. These things live or die based on passion and excitement. You need passionate actors, you need passionate crew, uh, whether they're a production assistant or whether they're the director of photography. You need people who are motivated because they love making films. Post-production, I think, uh, is, is really where it's at. Uh, you need to budget time. It always takes more time than you think it will to edit, to do music, to do a sound design, to tweak, to do color grading, authoring those uh, files at the end you need at least a week for post-production. There's some magic to be found in making movies in Ohio because you've got a lot of people who've never been involved with making movies, but they love the idea of being involved. If you go to LA or New York, people are jaded. They immediately, first question is, well, how much are you gonna pay me? In Ohio, Central Ohio, we are fortunate. We have got people excited, people excited about making movies. They wanna help filmmakers. You say, look, I'm making a movie. I have no budget or I have a, a tiny budget. They will help you just because they love the idea of being involved with making a movie. That's gold if you're a filmmaker. The Cleveland International Film Festival has been around, uh, we're on the 40th. This will be our 40th year. Uh, 26 years now, I believe, that uh, this will be the 26th year at Tower City after being at Cedar Lee for all the years before that. Um, Cedar Lee operating at his art theater sort of came out of the film festival. They, uh, John Foreman, who is the founder of the festival, uh, rented the theater originally to have the first festival there and did so well that that led to him working with the owner to end up acquiring the theater to run it as an uh, independent film theater, like it's an art house, like it has been ever since. Uh, and eventually the festival outgrew uh, the Cedar Lee, uh, the number of screens and the capacity and the lines around the corners and that, at which I did go to several festivals at the Cedar Lee. Uh, but I already had a deep passion for short films that had been developed from going to a film festival. Uh, I am one of those stories of a teenager who thought, you know, American films were the only thing. And uh, I remember in my early 20s, someone saying, you know, you gotta go to the Cedar Lee. And I'm like, subtitled films? Are you kidding me? Give me a break. Finally, someone got me to go see my life as a dog, and I was hooked. I'm like, okay, I've been dead wrong about this for my entire life. Uh, fell in love with films. So when the first festival came up after that, I went to the festival to see, I read the guide, picked a couple movies, but while I was there, I saw short film program, number one. What's a short film program? So out of curiosity, I went. And I went to every, sh after that, I was like, that is really cool. And I started going to all the shorts programs I could. The number of short films that are uh, submitted to us each year just keeps growing and growing. Uh, last year it grew from 1,300 over 1,600 in the, the last two years. I'm expecting, I'll be surprised if we don't hit 2,000 this year because it, a lot more people are capable of making short films now. There are more schools out there teaching people to make film. They're always producing shorts and they're submitting them to festivals. And our festival has, its notoriety keeps rising uh, in the festival circuit, so we keep getting a healthier dose of the submissions. For the average person going to films, what makes a film festival stand out is the interaction with the artists. We bring a lot of feature filmmakers, uh, the festival itself brings a lot of them to town, so there's a lot of Q&As with the actual artists. You get to uh, meet them, talk to them, and hear what's behind the art. So I really think the, o the only growth I'm expecting and where, where the festival's going is a continual focus on raising the quality of both programming and the way the festival operates. Well, if, if you're a filmmaker looking to submit to, to our festival or any festival that's like ours, which pretty much plays a wide variety of shorts, um, 
make sure your film is as tight and right as it can be. Don't mess up the sound. Number one, don't mess up the sound. We all, programmers all agree, if the sound is bad and annoying in any way or hard to hear, those are about the only films, I know for me, it's the only kind of film that I'll turn off. Make sure that your story is really good, that it's having the effect you want. Make sure to have other people look at the film before you send it out there. What is a producer? No job on a movie set is less defined than producer. It is the most underrated and overrated title people can get. They're either the most unappreciated, hardworking guy in a movie, or someone who just happened to do something seemingly innocuous, but without that act, the movie never would have been made. Because of the micro-budget tiny shoots that have become so common, the job of director and producer have fused into one. But when the productions get bigger and those two functions have to be separated, a lot of confusion ensues. The producer controls a project from inception to marketing. There are all kinds of producers, co-producers, associate producers, executive producers, co-executive producer, unit production managers, line producers, and even more titles. On an Arnold Schwarzenegger action movie from the 80s, one of the on-screen credits is a co-producer whose some total work on the film was that he was the hairstylist who the producer had hand Arnold the script. That earned him a co-producer credit. Kevin Smith on several of his books states he is the co-executive producer of an Oscar-winning film. The movie in question is Goodwill Hunting. Here's the sum total work that he did on that film. Kevin called Harvey Weinstein from the set of Chasing Amy and told him that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck had a script he should read. Harvey said okay and they hung up. Ta-da! He just co-executive produced an Oscar-winning film. In both of these examples, do they deserve these lofty co-producer titles? Yes! The movie never would have been made without them. The directors usually get the big credit by the press and the public, but the producers are the unsung heroes. Without Scott Mosier, there is no Kevin Smith. Without Lawrence Bender, we wouldn't know who Quentin Tarantino was. We may have recognized Ron Howard, and he would forever be Opie or Richie Cunningham if not for his producer, Brian Grazer. Mike McNeese from Baltimore, Ohio, has made a name for himself as a director and cinematographer. His first short film was Metal Storm in 2006. Let her go, Stone. Not another step, Martin. Just come with me. We can find out what happened. The idea for Metal Storm came from... It actually spawned from an online film competition. And the online film competition was for us to create a superhero short film um, within a three-week time span. The camera that we used for Metal Storm was the DVX-100A. Uh, it's the first camera that I ever bought. It's the only camera that I, that I owned at the time. Um, the entire crew was all people from uh, actually from my church so we had very little experience with proper equipment so we used a lot of work lights from the hardware store it was almost guerrilla style because i didn't know any better and, and certainly the, the friends i pulled from church didn't know much about what they were doing either metal storm was edited in final cut pro uh, might have been three or four at the time uh, we did a, a what I felt was a heavy color correction process. I learned a lot about color correction through doing Metal Storm. The music was an interesting story because we actually had um, two brothers from a Christian college in South Carolina drive up to Ohio and live in my house for a week while they scored this uh, 
what I what I still believe is a very complex score for the short film that you know worked out to every beat in the movie. I had a lot of help in the in the in the editing because I, I knew very little about editing films since I had never done it before. So um, Dan Welsh, who was one of the actor in the film, was very very helpful in helping me get the feel for what the what the edits should should be and how they should feel in the, in the pacing. And we actually had a few special effects shots that we worked in. Um, I actually had help from a guy in Chicago who found us online. Uh, through the competition, the online competition, and he wanted to help out with some special effects. So, so we had a lot of people collaborating. Well, the biggest surprise to me in the production of Metal Storm was how long it took to do everything. This was my first film, and you know, I thought, wow, three weeks to make a you know, five-minute movie? Piece of cake. But it ended up being you know, several long days of shooting, and we were up until the wee hours of the night shooting some of the pieces of it. Um, and it, and it took a huge group effort and of course, we didn't know what we were doing at the time, so um, so I was very proud of the people that we had working on it. Um, and I guess the, the thing that I took from it the most was that it was fun and it was something that I wanted to continue doing. Metal Storm was definitely the, the project that sort of launched me into wanting to do more filmmaking projects in the future. Well, now it's uh, several years later, and I, you know, when I look back at Metal Storm now, I'm still very proud of what we did uh, with the limited resources and the limited knowledge that we had. Uh, I'm very proud with how it turned out. It's, it's a fun little film and uh, you know a lot of people have told me that it's still their, their favorite of the work that I've done. Ridiculous. Motion picture editing is sometimes called the invisible art. An L-cut, also called split edit, is a device in editing that helps make going from one shot to another almost unnoticeable. If we edit a scene and only show the people who are talking, then the audience misses half the story, like this. Code blue, room 305. Uh, here's the doctor. The results from your test came back, and I have some bad news for you. What is it? You have a bronchial carcinoma. What is that? That's lung cancer. And I can refer you to an oncologist. You can discuss some treatment options. No. No, that, that's not possible. I came in for a cough I've had for a couple of weeks. I'm sorry. All doctors to the ER. Only showing the people talking is just too jarring. We want to see the character's reaction to what's being said to them. When we use L-cuts, the edits become more seamless because the audio or visual continued over the next shot. Psychologically, the viewer can fill in the blank of what the character speaking looks like after you cut to the person listening mid-sentence. Here is a scene with L-cuts. Code blue, room 305. Uh, here's the doctor. The results from your test came back and I have some bad news for you. What is it? You have a bronchial carcinoma. What is that? That's lung cancer. And I can refer you to an oncologist. You can discuss some treatment options. No. No, that, that's not possible. I came in for a cough I've had for a couple of weeks. I'm sorry. All doctors to the ER. It's called an L-cut because in the software on the timeline, it forms an L-shape between the two clips. Reactions are half the story. A character's nonverbal responses sometimes relay more of the emotion than the dialogue. Framelines presents another interactive project. Visit our website, www.framelines.tv and you can download the raw footage from our sample scenes and practice editing some of the techniques from the show. To practice L-cuts, also known as split edits, you can download the unedited clips and create your own scene. All you need is a computer or tablet with free editing software and you can create and upload your own version of the scene. 
To get the footage, go to our Vimeo page at vimeo.com slash framelines. Click on the segments, then click the download button. From there, you can choose the format you'd like, including Ultra HD 4K. Once you've gotten all the clips, import them into your editing software and start your edit. When you upload to YouTube or any other video site, make sure to use the hashtag FramelinesTV and follow the instructions from our site. Practice makes perfect. Have fun with this and be creative. If you'd like more information on the filmmakers or to purchase a DVD of tonight's program, please visit framelines.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. Cut and print it. That's all for this week. I'm Johnny DiLoretto, and thanks for watching Framelines. Framelines wraps up another episode. We hope you'll come back next time for another look into the world of indie filmmaking.